Good morning, I'm Frank Powers, and this is Lifestyle Tucson, the program where I speak to our neighbors, the people behind the scenes of our amazing organizations, small businesses, and nonprofits. Our friends are informing you how they serve our community, and they are here to give you updates on future projects. Let's make some new friends today. Arizona Lotus has partnered with Diamond Children's and Banner University Medicine to share updates about news and medicine as it relates to Tucson. This month, they'd like to share details about their Trauma Community Outreach Team, as May is Trauma Awareness Month. As the only Level 1 Trauma Center in Southern Arizona, they play a leading role in issues related to trauma and critical care. Trauma outreach programs include information for community groups interested in learning about the trauma program, outreach to government officials to help them develop public policy, as well as outreach to lawmakers so they can create better laws concerning the trauma care system and injury prevention, which we'll get into as well. Today, I'm fortunate enough to speak with Andy Tang, Trauma Medical Director at Banner. Andy, how you doing? I'm great, Frank. Thank you for having us. Yeah, and I've got Colin Stewart, Pediatric Trauma Medical Director at Banner. Colin, welcome to Lifestyle Tucson. All right, thanks. It's great to be here. I appreciate you both being here. I'm really excited. It's a whole party in here. There's a lot of people in here, all right, because the whole trauma team is with us. And I'm excited to talk about this because when I get my emails about this organization and like, hey, we've got this entire team and here's what they specialize in, it's fascinating. And then I go to the website and find out all about you guys. And you're really doing a lot of great work. So I've summed up a little bit of what you're doing, but give us a little more one-on-one on what the Trauma Community Outreach Team is all about. Well, I can take this one, Frank. Um, you know, when it comes to trauma, people think of injuries, but there's a lot more to it than that. In the hospital setting, we take care of patients who are injured, but then there's uh, events preceding the injury that lead to it, and there's events that happen after the injury, after the patients have been discharged. So the injury prevention aspect is preventing items that lead to patients getting to situations where they're either in car crashes, drownings, getting burned, et cetera, or interpersonal violence. Yeah. So we have developed a whole team with the main focus to work on prevention in addition to taking care of patients when they actually need us for medical you know, reasons and after injuries. Yeah. As G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle, right? And that's the thing, educating folks to not text and drive, to stop those car accidents, to be able to get CPR training so that they know how to help someone in an emergency and swimming lessons so no one's drowning. That's an important thing too. All these are amazing programs and things like that that exist. And I just tell me more about everything that you're doing when it comes to that. And also some of your injury prevention programs as well. Yeah, so we do a lot of uh, things for the community, and I think one of the benefits of our uh, trauma center is that we take care of people all the way from birth with our pediatric center to the adults, and so our outreach efforts are centered all over the spectrum. So you'll see us out. Um, we were recently at one of the mall events, you know, providing information about pediatric uh, trauma awareness and different things. Uh, we'll go to events and pass out helmets and things for bike safety. Mm. But then from the other extreme of life, we go out and we have a robust uh, fall prevention fair and outreach efforts to where we go to different uh, areas of the community to provide information to help you know the elderly and the uh, more advanced age uh, population of Tucson and how they can prevent falls. And so we're all out there in the community I think it's interesting because I feel like as trauma surgeons, we're one of the few jobs that are trying to put ourselves out of business. <laughs> That's a good point, <laughs> right? I often ask at the end of these interviews, if you had a wish for your organization, what would it be? And some of them do say, I wish we didn't exist. I wish everyone was safe. I wish everyone was fine, right? Isn't that something? But that's the point. Let's put you out of business by helping a lot of folks understand what it is to be safe. Even what you just said about helping the elderly realize how to avoid falling down. It's something to think about as we get older, myself included, that a small fall can really shatter your life. It can really affect so many things because of the injury and then what it takes to get to the PT and then afterwards, all that stuff. That's so hard and hard to put wrap your head around. So preventative. And education is really important. And you wouldn't think about something as simple as how do you not fall down? Fascinating. Tell me more about some of this. You know, you're, you're exactly right, Frank. In fact, this last Saturday, I was at the Chinese Cultural Center uh, doing a fall prevention fair with uh, Pete here, uh, who's our injury prevention coordinator. Um, at that event, there's about, I don't know, 25 or so uh, attendees. Um, almost all are in the elderly population age range. And exactly, we talked about the risks of falling, how to prevent it. 
Um, and it's surprising that um, something as simple as falling is not something that's really coming across our minds. But yet when it happens, it can be devastating. Yeah. And so I use some of the examples that we see as trauma surgeons. You know, simple fall for grandma who is taking a anticoagulant, Eliquis, Plavix, things of that sort. Simple fall, break some ribs, and that can be a literally a life-changing event. And it can certainly lead to death. Just from the, the fact that, you know, if patients are fairly deconditioned to, to begin with, uh, with advanced age, with decreased muscle mass, with, with compromised balance. And so when, when they take a simple fall, uh, things can be very devastating in terms of the recovery. And it was a very successful event. Um, we answered a lot of questions. In fact, um, during the event, there are a number of attendees who stood up and shared their stories of having suffered falls and how it had impacted their family and themselves. And so it really made the event a lot more touching and a lot more personal. So yeah, that's some of the things that we do in terms of fall prevention. And speaking of trauma, as you said before, that's not the injury itself. I was watching a documentary recently. I'm a big wrestling fan. And you, you look at wrestlers, and they, they go through a lot of traumatic problems and physical disabilities later on in life. And one of my favorite wrestlers, Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, uh, famously succumbs a lot to alcoholism. But one of the things that happens late to him in life is he takes a fall in his house and he's trapped there for three and a half days before someone finds him. The thing that was shocking about it wasn't that. It was his mental state after the three days. Being trapped for three days, stuck. Because imagine, you know, you have to go to the bathroom still and you have to this. And he, he couldn't save himself and luckily got found. And that's something that that stuck with him more than the inability to get up is it mentally scarred him. And that's such a, a traumatic thing to think about from something as simple as a fall. Again, we talk a lot a lot about cancer and, and real illnesses and stuff like that, but look at this simple thing that we can help stop. I think we all know someone who's actually fallen and had a pretty severe injury, you know? Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Frank. And the story that I just told about, um, you know, this person having fallen and unable to get up for three days, that is not uncommon at all. Yeah. I think any of the people here can tell you we receive patients like this on a fairly regular basis. Uh, they fall, whether it's the physical inability, deconditioning that prevents them from getting up, uh, or they suffer injuries that really prevent them from being able to get up uh, from the pain, what have you. It's not uncommon where days go by and these patients finally get to us because either a neighbor or a family a member decides to do a wellness check because mm -hmm. they haven't heard from them for a few days. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's very unfortunate. You know, it's not just the physical aspects of it. It's the psychological trauma that patients suffer from being stuck in that situation. Yeah, trauma, suffice to say, trauma impacts all of us in some way or form. And uh, you're right. Um, we all know someone who's gone into a car accident, mm -hmm. have taken a fall, or even more unfortunate, know of someone who's been involved in, in interpersonal violence terrifying stuff there. And that's where a lot of trauma stuff happens. Because when we talk about health in this country, the biggest thing that we're talking about these days is mental health and how to survive a lot of these situations and break out of them, get out of them and know the signs of like when you need to escape a situation that's just getting worse. So that's something that's really great that you're helping educate a lot of folks on. And education really is the key to safety and success when it comes to anyone. And we're talking about uh, the elderly a lot there, but let's talk about some of the younger folks that we're helping out. So tell me a little bit about the pediatric side of all of this stuff and what you're doing when it comes to trauma and helping kids maybe cope with it and deal with it. Yeah, so some of the things that we've been doing is going to the schools throughout the community. We uh, go and do these teen mazes where they go around and get information. And some of it is involved in showing them the way that their life can be affected by trauma. And I think for a lot of these middle school and high school kids, um, also part of that is involved with gun violence. Uh, one of our partners yep. is uh, partnering with several different organizations in the community to go out and give gun violence education. And I think taking that into the middle schools, the high schools, and really bringing that information when you can really impact someone's life going forward really plays a big difference. You know, trying to intervene in a vulnerable part of people's lives to prevent further trauma while they're still children, still young adults, and then going forward uh, really prevents the trauma downstream. Topics are hard to talk about sometimes, and I almost do feel like I see a lot of the fact that people shy away from the tougher topics when it comes to kids. I've been doing this 
side project in my own life. I'm doing a lot of research on Mr. Rogers. And that's why Mr. Rogers was such a big deal to the generations that he helped raise because he would talk about tough things. He wasn't there to be Pee Wee Herman. It wasn't there to just be wacky and silly and funny for kids. It's there to say, we're going to talk about divorce this week. We're going to talk about a death in the family. And that was the theme of the week. And I don't think that really we're, we're stepping up to that as much as we used to. I think we shy away from some of the stuff to protect the kids, protect the kids. And sometimes you got to talk about these things to keep them safe, keep them aware that the real world can be dangerous and can be scary and can be hurtful. And the way to avoid some of it is prevention. Let's talk about some of the programs that you do have when it comes to the injury prevention. Because your injury prevention program treats more than 6,000 children and adults that have been involved in trauma each year. And it can occur at any age, obviously. But I'm reading through it. You've got your, you were talking about the bike safety. You were talking about the stand and fall prevention. Let's talk about some of the other stuff and the fact that we want to talk about pedestrian safety on the streets because there have been an increase in some of those incidents. Tell me more about what we're doing to keep our citizens walking safely in the streets of Tucson. Uh, my name is Pete Plummer. I'm the Trauma Outreach and Injury Prevention Coordinator at Banner University Medical Center. So, yes, we have um, identified over the past years there was an uptick in some of our pedestrians that get struck by motor vehicles. And so it's a multifaceted uh, problem, so we can try to go at it from different angles. But we have partnered with Tucson Police, um, other organizations such as Community Bridges that helps uh, unsheltered and homeless individuals find shelter. And so we've gone out to what we call hotspots. We can identify through our statistic and database as well as the cities where we're having the most uh, pedestrians that are struck by motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually gone out into the community, made contact with people, um, given them um, reflective uh, footwear, backpacks, things of that nature. The community bridges folks uh, make contact with them and treat, see if they can get them counseled to a point where they can get into some sort of sheltered uh, position. Um, so we've, we've had that campaign. We work with the city um, in regards to engineering because sometimes it comes down to the way the streets are designed. Yep. And for the most part, historically speaking, America's love affair with the vehicle was to go fast and get from point A to point B as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that uh, given all these other circumstances, such as the, our population of uh, homeless individuals is higher than a lot of cities, um, and the fact that some of these people um, are suffering from mental uh, health issues, they're not on medications, so they may be altered, and so they might not be aware that they're crossing a street into traffic, against traffic, or against traffic uh, direction signals. And so, and a lot of it happens at night. And so our streets aren't very well lit. Uh, these people aren't clothed very properly. And so it's difficult if you have people who are maybe exceeding the speed limit. Um, you take a look at some of our arterial roads, such as Broadway and Speedway and Grant, where the speed limit's 35 or 40, usually means people are going about 50, maybe plus. It's true. And so when you take a look at statistics, you take a look at somebody who is struck by a car at 20 miles an hour, they may have a, like an 8 to 10% chance of dying from those injuries. But you increase the speed of the vehicle that hits them just by 10, 15 miles an hour, and that chance of mortality exponentially goes up to about 80%. And so we work with the city. If, if you notice, like in our downtown areas around the campus and downtown, the streets have been redesigned. They're much more narrow. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have bike lanes. Mm -hmm. There's many more stop and go lights, which forces people to slow down and not go as fast. And so those designs need to be taken to the rest of the city and especially our arterial roads because we have a, a disproportionate amount of pedestrians that are struck on arterial roads. What's but an arterial ar road? An arterial road would be one of these like Grant, Speedway, Broadway, okay. uh, Campbell, those main thoroughfares but those main thoroughfares only make up three percent of all the roads in the entire city and the county of right wow and so but it accounts for almost 80 percent of all our pedestrians that are struck so there's a i'm there's not a surprised disconnect there it's so. the concentrated amount of humanity that's in that area down yep. by the college area 
because the amount of population of drivers has only increased in the last 10, 15 years. The amount of homelessness has increased. The student body has increased. Everything's increased. And the potholes and the dangers on the roads. That's what's increased, too. So I do talk to the Department of Transportation. They're doing their best as well. And we talked all about what they did do on Grant because they did make a lot of changes on Grant Road for that reason, for safety. So we are doing a lot with the Department of Transportation, working together with you guys to find out, get all the analytics to keep people safe just so you can walk around. And that's really important. None of this stuff is stuff that should be glossed over. We think it's just so easy to have a city, don't we? Right? Yep. But no, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes, obviously, to make all these things work and a lot of partners and partnerships that make all of these things work. So I appreciate all that insight. That's really important. What are some of the programs that we can talk about now when it comes to other things that you offer? Let's get off the streets. Let's get in the water. We've got water safe babies. You've got safe hiking programs. You've got wake up programs. What's a wake up program? So the wake-up program is something that we used to do before COVID. And so one of our partners is Arizona Youth Partnership. Dr. Stewart talk, just talked about the Teen Maze program, and that is uh, run by the Arizona Youth Partnership in conjunction or coordination with all of our school districts. Mm -hmm. And to, to expand a little bit further on that, um, we go into the high schools. It's a multifaceted or multidisciplinary group. There's people from Pima County attorneys, law enforcement, juvenile courts. And so the kids come in, the sophomore class comes into the school that day and they uh, go into the gymnasium and they uh, start having a house party, simulated house party. Mm. The police come in, do a fake or quote bust of this house party. Sure, Everybody gets a, a citation and that citation basically gives them a scenario. Huh. And then they have to go to three or four different stations in a gymnasium, and, and we are one of those stations. And so what we do is we talk about their scenario. And so maybe the scenario is, hey, you went to the house party. Congratulations, you didn't drink any alcohol or eat anything suspicious, but you got into a car with somebody who is obviously under the influence, and you weren't wearing a seatbelt. They rolled the car, you were ejected, and now you come into our trauma bay as a severely injured trauma patient. So we talk about the, the injuries, short-term consequences, long-term consequences, how that affects you, your future aspirations, whether it's music, theater, college, trade school, military, and such, how that affects your family and friends. And then we go back to the beginning and go, what could have changed this? And of course, it all comes down to decision-making. Mm. And so what has come of that is Arizona Youth Partnership they get uh, students recommended um, and referred to them by the courts, the school districts that are at risk. And so what they do is they bring them into the hospital setting, specifically the trauma bay and the surgical trauma ICU. And they get to shadow the staff, the doctors, the residents, nurses, paramedics, in real time when some of these trauma patients actually come into the hospital. And they can see these patients and the efforts that are made to sustain life. Uh, they get to hear the everything that's going on. They hear the patients that are in distress. Uh, they smell the smells. Mm -hmm. They see the sights. And, and it is basically a, a wake up to them to say, hey, maybe I should start making some dis different decisions about what I'm doing in my life. That's so really it's been important. very successful and very well received. I love everything you just described because, again, that's some real education for kids. Kids think they're invulnerable. That's the problem. Young people do think that they're just made of titanium. Well, we were all 10 I've, foot tall and bulletproof at one point, right? right? And then you kind of realize, oh my goodness, I should not have this. Or if I just thought for a moment, you got to be sometimes strong enough to stand up to your best friend and say, hey, I'll be driving home. You had too much. And that's important to do. I really love everything you just told me that, and everything you just talked about, because that sounds like you are actually doing a lot to help these kids out, save some lives and show them some real experience or some real trauma to show them trauma exists and yep. we can prevent it. So what do you want to tell me about that's also really important? Frank, I want to tell you about the Stop the Bleed program. It's actually a national program that was started by the American College of Surgeons. And uh, the initiation of it was, uh, you know, when we, when we looked at the school shooting events mm -hmm. that are so terribly unfortunate, the post-action analysis shows that there are a number of children who pass away because of the severity of the injuries. We could not have saved them. 
But what's heartbreaking is that there are a number of people who pass away under these circumstances who could have been easily saved had they known the simple techniques to prevent bleeding. Mm. Okay. Uh, we're talking about bleeding from the extremities. When I say extremities, that's a medical term for arms or legs. Okay. Right. Um, simple maneuvers like compression hold an area that's wounded, that's bleeding. Um, tourniquet usage or packing a wound. Right. These are the three techniques that's so simple uh, and can be life-saving. But what some of these post-action analysis have shown was that because folks at the scene did not know these simple techniques, um, they were not you know, employed and lives were lost. And so as a result of these events, uh, multiple national organizations, including the American College of Surgeons, got together and says, hey, why don't we develop a program just like ACLS or BLS, right, um, that we can teach to the community at mass and educate them on these simple techniques of hemorrhage control. And so that's something that we do. It's a free service that we offer to anybody in town. We've given this course to uh, churches, uh, to restaurants, to businesses, to schools, you name it. I think the most recent one was to uh, uh, one of the school district's uh, safety officer groups. And we have one that's upcoming to one of the local high schools. Uh, again, this course is about two hours in length. We kind of go through a lecture that's very easy to understand. Again, it's aimed at um, for anybody to understand and be able to comprehend and, um, and grasp the uh, concepts discussed. And then we also do a hands-on demonstration so that when people walk away, they're well employed, well, um, well uh, versed in these uh, simple techniques. Again, some of the hugest stuff you can do is learning the simplest little skill to save lives. When I talk to, I think it's the American Heart Association or uh, American Red Cross, they offer CPR training for free. And the amount of CPR training that no one knows that could really save people. Knowing the Heimlich maneuver, how many people, we should all know it. We should all be taught that in schools. Like, why don't we all just know that? And there are very simple life-saving things. And that is huge. So I really do believe that that's probably one of the most important things you probably are teaching. Because that little bit can save so many lives in so many situations. Just, again, being able to do a tourniquet. Things we see in movies that we take for granted. You know, yeah. where people just, oh, we, you do that. That's what you do. Right. You know, so fascinating stuff that you're helping people learn this, realize this, and try to educate them for free and educate as many people as you can at these big organizations. So I'll give you a recap and tell you where to go to find out how you can maybe get some of these folks to come to your organization, get booked so you can get some of this training so that you'll know how to save some lives if ever anybody is, you know, in one of these precarious situations, which we hope is not actually happening, just bleeding. And we've talked a lot about prevention. What about when someone's actually needing to go to the trauma center? What should they do? Tell me all about it. Yeah, so what we've uh, found through years of research and different studies is that time is key in trauma. You know, we used to talk about the golden hour uh, in trauma, about you got to get things taken care of or the chance of uh, significant mortality, morbidity. It just goes up as time goes on. And so I think knowing what your resources in your community are, where you can go, um, some of the things that we've worked on is we've just recently been working on getting uh, Banner University South as a level three trauma center. So that's in the works. But also knowing that we are at Banner University Medical Center in Tucson, the level one trauma center uh, for adults and a, a level two trauma center for pediatrics. Knowing where to go, where to take your loved ones, where to take yourself is going to be key because time matters and getting to the place that's going to provide you definitive care is the thing that's going to give you the best chance at saving your life. Again, that does sound, it does even almost sound a little like we're talking about preventative because it's like knowing where the exits are. You know, you got to know the fire emergency for your own home, for your children. You teach them, if there's a fire, here's what we do. It's a fire drill. Teaching people to have a drill for the situation. This emergency happened, I know exactly. Get in the car, we're going exactly to Banner right now. We know to go because we made this decision. We had a plan. So that is really important. That's right. I think the importance is, is understanding what a trauma center is and how does it impact patients in a positive way. Um, if we're to go to a local hospital, um, they may not have a 24-7 prepared operating room, 24-7 staffed surgeons in the hospital. Uh, we have anesthesiologists that are, that are on the ready. We have 
dozens and dozens of blood and uh, plasma and platelets that are ready to be transfused for the patient who needs it. Um, we have all the subspecialty services, whether it's orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, vascular surgery, interventional radiology, et cetera. The point is, every one of these services that I mentioned are on the ready at a split second to be activated. Uh, a patient can come into our, our hospital and we can go from the trauma bay to the operating room within five minutes. Wow. And that is a readiness that cannot be said for any other hospitals uh, who are not prepared to receive trauma patients or who are not trauma centers. Yeah, last time I was at the hospital, it took me five minutes to walk across the parking lot. So that's incredible, all right? Wow, uh, what an amazing resource. And again, the knowledge of knowing where to go is what's important. And that's what they're telling you here. You've got a big event coming up in June. Okay, that's great. This is actually something that we're super, super proud of in addition to everything else that Pete has mentioned. Um, it's called the Southwestern Surgical Trauma Conference. And this conference was started 30 plus years ago with the intention of just providing good education to our local pre-hospital community, mm -hmm. pre-hospital EMS and paramedics community, uh, to bring them the most up-to-date information on how to take care of trauma patients um, and at the same time provide a fun environment. I believe the first conference, again, 30 plus years ago was maybe a handful of people, 10, 15. Mm -hmm. And now it's grown to a conference of about 500 wow. on an annual basis. And last time I looked at it, we had people from nearly 20 states wow. across the country. So it's, it's expanded beyond just a local phenomenon. And again, so we, we, we kept the mission just the same, which is to provide the best education, most updated education when it comes to trauma to our EMS providers. Mm -hmm. um, because of the targeted audience, obviously the content somewhat differs than a conference aimed at physicians. Um, and this is a fun crowd. It takes place at uh, Casino del Sol this year. Nice. Yep. And uh, I think it'll be a fun forum. Uh, it's two days long. Um, starts at 7 in the morning and goes to about 5 p.m. The, you know, each day. After the first day, we'll have a pool party, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which will be fun. We'll have a DJ there. And, you know, again, the whole point is we want to learn. We yes. want to learn as a community. We want to learn from each other. But at the same time, I enjoy learning with friends in a fun environment. And so this conference is not stuffy at all. Right. Uh, you know, we've, Colin and I have, have certainly been to conferences where it's, uh, you know, suit and ties and, you know, uh, very formal. This is not one of those conferences. Wow. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's just a very relaxed atmosphere. We have expert uh, speakers locally as well as nationally. Uh, Colin will be speaking there. He'll be speaking about pediatric trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be hosting the event um, as chairman. We have orthopedic surgeons that will talk about, you know, what can a EMS provider do for a patient with fractured limbs that they identify at the scene. Someone with, uh, you know, pelvic fractures, for example, that's something very deadly and, 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 um, and serious. Um, we can, uh, we'll have people talk about uh, wilderness medicine. Uh, I know a lot of folks uh, in, the, in the audience and also just locally in this community, we enjoy the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So we'll have topics on, uh, on wilderness medicine. We'll talk about child trafficking. Wow, um, that's been a big topic growing is the human trafficking, it's huge. That's right. It's a huge topic. And we'll have the chief medical officer from uh, Border Patrol. Okay. Um, his name is Alex Eastman. Um, he'll be coming to speak to us and give us a more uh, local flavor on what's happening around our border in terms of health care uh, for the, for the uh, folks who cross the border and get themselves into um, health conditions, whether mm -hmm. it's trauma or otherwise. So Alex Eastman will be coming to speak on that. Uh, again, it's, it's going to be a fun conference. We have um, the uh, medical examiner's office mm -hmm. and come and talk about some of the things that they see, um, again, related to trauma. It'll just be a great conference. We have a raffle that's associated with the conference uh, just to get more engagement. We have attendees from, boy, multiple agencies locally as well as uh, law enforcement and actually parts of the military in their medical units. Excellent. Um, and so it's a, I really feel that it's a conference that serves a very humble uh, purpose to our community. Um, 
And uh, I think every year we deliver. It, it's uh, It's been great. Originally, the conference was going to be in June, but now it's set for August 1st and 2nd. You got to check this thing out because it seems like you're going to learn a lot. Is it open to everybody? Anyone can go to this thing? It is or, open to everyone. All right. I love it. I don't want to be inviting people to parties that aren't you know, open to the public. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. Go get some education, learn a lot, and get involved, get informed. That's really the most important thing we can do. So let's just close out. I know there's one more important note. I just want your final thoughts. What can we do as a radio DJ? It's my job by law to ask this. How do we beat the heat? What do we do to prevent uh, sun trauma that we're going to experience as the weather gets hotter, the sun's out, it's Arizona, it's Tucson. Sometimes people are unaware of it. We all know we got to drink more water, but how do we take care of ourselves when it comes to the sun, maybe our skin, things like that? Yeah. Conley, you want to take this one and I can supplement yeah, so I think, you know, we're all blessed to live in a place where we get sunshine all the time, except for, you know, those few times when the monsoon comes roaring over the hills. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think what you have to do is be aware. Be aware of the surroundings, you know, especially for, like, kids. They'll be out when you're out on the playground. Be aware that the monkey bars are going to be hot. you got to mm -hmm. watch out for your kids and make sure they're not touching things that are hot and that are going to burn them. Whenever people are out, the sidewalk is extremely hot. And... This is something that we haven't talked about yet, but we have a robust burn program at our hospital as well that's part of our trauma team. And so if you get any injuries from the heat, touching things that are hot, any burns, we're here to help take care of you as well. You know, when you're out there, it doesn't take that long in the middle of the day to get a sunburn. So make sure that you're wearing protective clothing, wearing sunscreen, wear a hat. You know, you don't want to end up having a skin cancer from too many sunburns on the top of your head. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you just have to take care of yourself. Is Stay my bald hydrated. spot showing? Jeez, keep it down. Don't pick on a guy. No. Well, you, you got your hat on, so you're all, <laughs> you're all good. <laughs> so, you know, but I think protection and prevention, just like everything else, is the key. Yeah, I agree. And I think just to be aware of how hot the sun can get. You know, if you look at the pavement, we've certainly seen demonstrations of people cooking eggs mm -hmm. uh, on the top of a car or on the on the pavement. And uh, it's not unheard of uh, where we see patients in the summertime, particularly, you know, that decide to run out uh, bare feet and thinking that, hey, it's going to be a quick run. I'm just going to jot to the uh, mailbox or I'm going to chase after my pet really quickly and I'll run back right back home. Um, but, uh, you know, that short few seconds can result in devastating burns yeah. uh, to the bottom of the feet. Um, and, you know, that's particularly dangerous for folks who have diabetes or peripheral neuropathy, mm. uh, where the, the, the pain is not necessarily felt uh, right away. And so they, they may continue to continue on that activity uh, rather than stopping and, and end up with, um, you know, very, very severe injuries that can be quite debilitating. Uh, the other thing to be mindful of is um, substance use, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's alcohol or other forms of substance, um, you know, people, you know, get a little tipsy, get a little too happy, drink a little too much, fall asleep in the sun, and that can mm. result in pretty severe burns um, just by, by the exposure. Yeah, no, that's true. I one time uh, on a vacation fell asleep in the sun at, where was I, Virginia Beach or something like that, and I got a third-degree sunburn on my arm and a second-degree burn on my chest, yeah. and it was very traumatic, very painful and scary to this day. They said this, because of this, you are now more likely to develop uh, skin cancer later on in life or something. And it's like, wow. So it's a lesson. That's one time I fell asleep once, one day. So very, very good advice right there. That's very important. And a lot of this is also going to be available. More advice. Where can we find some of your resources online? If you just type in trauma cats, it will, it will be the first uh, item that pops up. Mm. And on it, you will be able to see a lot of the outreach uh, events that we do. Um, along with the various services that we talked about. Trauma, 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 cats, ho. Now you know where to go to go find out where you're going to get all the help because today we made friends with Andy Tang, Trauma Medical Director at Banner, as well as Colin Stewart, Pediatric Trauma Medical Director at Banner University, and Pete's back there over there. Pete, thank you so much. You did a great job as well. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. This was Lifestyle Tucson. 
Bing bong bing. Time for a recap. I really enjoyed my conversation with our new friends and old friends now at Diamond Children's and Banner University of Medicine. We're going to be having them in at least once a month, I believe. I'm going to try to, because every month is something to focus on, with this being Trauma Prevention Month. Yes, we're trying to help out a lot of folks in town, and hopefully you learned a lot from this great episode, and they're going to learn a lot from their big event. And you can jump in the pool, too, if you're interested in checking out the 33rd Southwest Regional Trauma Conference. Go to swtrauma.com and get all the details. The dates were originally in June, but now they've moved it to August 1st and August 2nd at the beautiful Casino del Sol. Go get all the information or email them at info at swtrauma.com and go check out the 33rd Southwest Regional Trauma Conference. Make sure you go look up Google or Bing the Trauma Cats and then you'll find out everything that they're going to find out when they get done with their big uh, event in June and pool party. Hopefully they have a good time there as well. So I want to thank our old friends at Diamond Children's and Banner University of Medicine for joining me today. You've been listening to Lifestyle Tucson. For more information about this program or to listen to something you may have missed, go to the Sunday Mornings page on klpx.com, kfma.com, mixfm.com, or ESPN Tucson. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and Audible, or wherever fine podcasts are not a traumatic experience. I'm your BFF, your best Frank forever, Frank Powers, Toot Toot Tucson. I love you the most.